Ramadan begins. Another terror threat dominates the headlines. Of course, uh, bombs blowing up in mosques. It's another black eye for Muslims worldwide who are trying to fight the image that extremists really represent their religion. Robert Spencer is the author of the Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, and he joins us from Boston. Robert, thanks for being here. So there's Thank always you. confusion about Islam. Is it a religion of violence or peace? Well, this is the great politically correct falsehood that is taught everywhere, that Islam is a religion of peace that's been hijacked. Islam is actually unique among the religions of the world in having a developed doctrine, theology, and legal system that mandates warfare against unbelievers. And this is what moderate Muslims have to face and reject forthrightly and honestly if there's really going to be an end to violence committed in the name of Islam. Muhammad in particular, this guy made his name in war. Yes. He was a warrior prophet. He taught that the uh, Muslims had to meet the unbelievers in battle and invite them to accept Islam or second-class status under Islamic rule, or there would be war. So not the Jesus way of getting apostles winning people over with, uh, with speeches? And, uh, no, hardly. And, or or uh, the Gandhi way. Uh, if they don't believe, uh, kill them. Well, kill them or subjugate them. The uh, Quran in chapter 9, verse 29, and Islamic tradition and law uh, allow for Jews and Christians to practice their religion in the Islamic State, the same kind of Islamic State that Osama bin Laden and Zwahri and Zarqawi want to establish today. They can practice their religions, but under only severely restricted circumstances with all manner of institutionalized discrimination. Uh, it's a funny thing that many people point to this as a great sign of tolerance and mutual respect when actually there's no sense of universal dignity or universal rights in this scheme of things, but only a decidedly second-class status for Christians and Jews. So do you reject the notion that the terrorists are are bastardizing Islam. Right, they are not. They are obviously not all Muslims are terrorists and not all Muslims endorse the terrorist perspective. However, the terrorists are working from a broad tradition within Islam. And the sooner this is recognized by Muslims and non Muslims, the sooner that both people of goodwill in both camps will be able to find positive ways to deal with it. Well, you point out uh, the history of uh, Muhammad, his uh, you know, biography here, compare it to Jesus, not saying who's right or wrong, but just c comparing and contrasting. Tell right. me about the Battle of Badr, B-A-D-R, and how it compares to what's happening today. Well, this is a decisive battle in early Islamic tradition. It's a battle in which Muhammad, with a vastly outnumbered force, about 300 of his warriors compared to 1,000 of the pagan force that was fighting him, uh, he prevailed. And this was, a, the, this was considered to be a sign that Allah had blessed the Muslims and was going to prosper their cause. Uh, the same kind of uh, thing, actually this battle itself, has been invoked many times in the modern age, particularly with the victory over the Soviets in Afghanistan, as a sign that Allah is blessing the jihad terrorists today and, if and we were advancing to leave Iraq, their cause wouldn't that be in the same another way. Chapter? Wouldn't that be another example? If we were to leave Iraq, oh, there they go again. Oh, yes. The outnumbered terrorists win. A precisely, yes. And so these kinds of things are precedents. Muhammad's example is a precedent, and he is considered to be the perfect man. So the fact that he did pursue battles, order the assassinations of his enemies, have multiple wives, that kind of thing, it's not just a matter of history. He was a perfectly ordinary 7th century warrior, but his model is considered normative for all times by mainstream Islam, and this is why this kind of violence continues to recur. Okay, Robert Spencer, author of the Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades. Thanks for being here this morning. It's number, Thank you. Uh, it's number 15 on the bestseller list, and so many people have so many questions about Islam because no, mo most of us don't grow up with the Koran. Mm -hmm. A lot of the answers can be found here, not in opinion, but in text and in quotes. Just yes. So there's something going on in America that's, that, that's, that, that's big, it's somewhat disturbing, and it's kind of happening underground. You might not see it on the news a whole lot, even though you saw a couple of news clips. It's not like it's not really in your face. I think the last big thing was maybe the Ground Zero mosque, but it's not really that big. Um, but there's some, something happening underground, and you probably will encounter this either after you graduate, at your job, coworkers, with even friends maybe. And so that's why um, I think it's important that I go over this because. You can have all this knowledge about Islamic Muslims on one hand, and people can be saying things that don't make any sense. 
And so I'm going to try to put that into context. Um, so what we're going to talk about is Islamophobia. So you, you, you see the word, you kind of know what it means, it's phobia, Islam. But the actual definition is a closed-minded prejudice against or hatred of the religion of Islam. And it's really turned into hatred. And I'll tell you how, what, um, you know, as I, as I go along, what that hatred looks like. Um, of course, questioning Islam or disagreeing with Muslims is not Islamophobia. If you think fasting is tough or praying, you pray too much doesn't make you Islamophobe. That just means you disagree with some practices of the faith. Um, so I'm going to make that clear and tell you what I mean by that. Um, but before I start, it's important to think about the day and age we live in. Um, you know, when I was growing up, oh my gosh, before the internet, <laughs> um, you know, you. You went to class, you went to the library, you, you, you looked in the encyclopedia what the facts are, what something is. And knowledge was knowledge, and facts were facts. Now, you can really get away with making a whole lot of stuff up. Not, not in a college environment. You guys aren't going to be allowed to do that. So when you, when you finish, you're going to see a lot of people are just making things up, and the loudest voices win. We've got Fox News, MSNBCs, the people who shout the loudest, and and sound right are the ones who are perceived to be right. Um, and so facts and knowledge are less important than that actual opinions. Um, and the internet has made it possible. So what, you know, what is expertise? When you think of an expert, an expert is, you know, if I was a legal, a legal expert, I would have to have a law degree, right? If I'm an expert on, I don't know, geology, I would have to, I would have to have, I can't just say I'm a geologist, I collect rocks, I have to have a degree in that. So. Uh, that's unfortunately changing. Anybody who makes up a website or says, oh, I'm an expert on this, is perceived as an expert. Oh, I'm an expert on Islam. Uh, what are your credentials? Well, I don't know, I just made a website. So that's kind of where uh, things are changing. Uh, we have a lot of email chains going around. Oh, Barack Obama is a Muslim, and things are, things are gonna, you know, he's gonna change the world, and America's going to, uh, people are starting to catch on to this uh, phobia. And so all of this has led to a, uh, um, a lot of speakers and lecturers going out and doing trainings and speeches and lectures on, on Islam in their own terms. And a, a lot of it is just pure hate, but it's being presented as factual stuff. Okay. And of course, you might, you might encounter this. You might uh, see a Facebook event saying, you know, come, come, come learn about what Islam really is. Whenever you see the word really, you should, you should get worried. Find out what they really want to do or find out what Muslims are hiding from you. Those are some of the titles of these events that we see. Okay. All right. So the bottom line, if you are an Islamophobe, a person who just hates Muslims, you have come to believe that terrorism is normal Muslim behavior. It's not just a fringe thing. It's not just a group of thugs and you know uh, folks who are mad about politics and things like that. It's every Muslim is expected to carry out terrorism eventually. Um, you know, this, things were at, weren't actually that bad. I remember during the, the 9-11, I was a freshman in college, and the three, four years after that, yeah, there were hate crimes, some mosques got burned and vandalized, and people were upset, and that's, that, that's kind of natural to be expected after such, such a big thing. But things went down after 2003, and a lot of it had to do with, you know, President Bush, I'll give him credit, said, look, we're not at war with Islam over, and he used to say that over and over uh, during his first term. Fortunately, during his second term, it kind of went away. And we saw, we saw kind, of, kind of a rise in anti-Muslim feelings uh, in 07, 08, 09, and even more so now. And, and so I'll go through that. So say you're uh, walking through the quad and somebody passes out a flyer and says, uh, hey, come to this event. Some speaker is here. He's going to tell us what, what true Islam really is, what your professor doesn't want you to know. And these are some of the things this expert, expert, big gigantic quotes, might say about his expertise, his or her expertise. So it'll be my college student. Um, I know Muslims. Usually they don't, but they just say they do. Um, just look at Islamic history. It's so violent, full of wars and conquests. So is human history in general. But yeah, look at Islamic history. Um, I have read the Quran in their books. Again, a lie. It's something that they'll claim. Um, better to be safe than sorry. It's better for us to just to be scared of Muslims and, 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 and stay away from them than, than to actually get hurt or something like that. Um, of course, we are at war with these people. How could you not trust me? I'm, I care about this uh, country. So these are some of the things you might hear. 
uh, if you ever went to one of these events. So where, where does this uh, come from and why now? Um, I mean, you, you guys know that I'm part of this organization, it's my full-time job, actually overtime job, doing this all the time. And we found that um, over the last 10 years, $42 million has actually been spent on, on uh, these anti-Muslim hate groups. Like a lot of funding, a lot of money has gone to build organizations. And it's taken them 10 years to really you know, get staff and have offices and things like that. And so now, 2010, 2011, 2012, we're seeing the products and consequences of, of their work. Um, you know, they produce a lot of books, like um, How Can Islam Be Peaceful? Muhammad the, the uh, Murderer is a, is a title of the book, or um, All Muslims Are Terrorists is the title of the book, of the DVD. So these are the products that are being produced and being passed out nationwide. Uh, another thing that this money has done is there's organizations, they call themselves security consultants. And so they, they've gone around, they've flown to almost every major police department in America and said, hey, you know, we're going to train your cops on how to find terrorists. Okay, yeah, sure, we need some counterterrorism training, that sounds good. Okay, this is how you find a terrorist. See who prays five times a day, see who gives charity, and see who looks like a Muslim. And so they've turned basics of being a Muslim into, into things that, that, uh, that, that are violent, and things that, that should be... Uh, watched for, um, and, and so all this is going on, and and who who sees that all this comes to, to my office, to my desk? Somebody called uh, a few months ago and said I got pulled over for speeding, and the cop uh, saw my wife. She was wearing a headscarf, and he started asking questions about how much I pray, and and he started asking questions about what we what we think of terrorism. So, but I was speeding, and that was kind of weird. And then I realized, well, his that that cop's department was trained by one of these guys, right? So. It's turned into um, all sorts of uh, uh, policies where our law enforcement officials will think, well, the more religious you are, the more likely you, you are to be a terrorist. And this is a problem for two things. One, it's wrong. It's completely infactual, right? Uh, it's completely violating uh, the civil rights of American Muslims. And three, it's not keeping anybody safe. Your, your job is to keep us safe. You're, you're questioning somebody how much they pray. Um, and the real person who actually probably does want to do something that just drove right by you and you didn't know. So, so our law enforcement officials aren't even doing the right thing by going by engaging in this. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a sec. Um, and one of the most disturbing things, um, you will see uh, that I will mention the Tea Party and the Republican Party. Uh, I'm not condemning a party. I'm not saying I'm, I'm a Democrat or anything. But we are seeing acceptance of some of these things in these political movements. If you if you happen to be involved in, in the Tea Party or the GOP. Uh, it's up to you to go back and say, hey, you know, I think I think some of these things are wrong. It's not good for America. So, so I'm not saying it's, it's bad to be a, a part of that group. The consequence of, of somebody like Newt Gingrich saying Islam is a threat to America is huge because people look up to him and they say, well, if he said it, then it must be right. And so um, we're seeing that um, becoming a problem. Isn't it? Okay. So what are some of these anti-Muslim hate groups that, that do these law enforcement trainings, that produce these books, that, that write blogs and things like that? Uh, some of the uh, biggest ones are Act for America. Uh, their mission statement is to stop the spread of Islam in America. So, like that, that's the only reason they exist. They have chapters nationwide. They, they meet once a month and come up with ways to stop Muslims. They really have, uh, you know, it, it's amazing people have time for this, but, but they're, they're really uh, organized. Stop the Islamization of America was was the group that kind of started the whole uh, Ground Zero Mosque thing. Uh, that was there. The funny thing is that Ground Zero Mosque uh, already existed. Uh, there was already a mosque there, but then they turned it into this huge thing and this hoo-ha -ha about, about a mosque being here, uh, Ground Zero. When in fact, it, there were actually three mosques right, right, right there in New York, and there's never been a problem. And so they, they find ways to create these uh, <coughs> controversies. Um, and then how many of you guys are familiar with Daniel Pipes? Anybody? Does Daniel Pipes ring a bell? You told me to mention Daniel Pipes. OK. <laughs> um, Dan Daniel Pipes is one of these fake scholars. He's, he doesn't have a degree in Islam or anything, but he says, well, I know everything about Islam and Muslims. Look at me. He writes books. He gives lectures. And he started an organization here, based here in Philadelphia called Middle East Forum. Uh, their office is like three blocks away from mine. So it's kind of weird when I run into them. But um, you know, so. It's, they also have uh, blogs and, 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 and 
hate sites and things like that. And, and there's many more, many more organizations that are very well funded that are doing this work. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure what drives them. I don't think it's, it's part hate and part like a twisted uh, uh, patriotism. I'm sure many of them think they're really helping America. Um, you know, that, that's a fine, sin sincere intention, but it's also a, a misled intention. You can, you know, so, so they have the, all these ideas about Islam, but they think they're helping America by, uh, by protecting it from Muslims. So they're being uh, misled by a lot, a lot of uh, people. Um, let's see, 40% of all Americans hold an unfavorable view of Islam. And I want to define unfavorable. It seems like, oh, I just don't like Muslims that much. No, these, this is like Muslims shouldn't be allowed to run for Congress or they, they shouldn't be allowed to travel or they, shouldn't, they should have to wear a special ID or something like that. So uh, it, it's, a little, it's, a, it's a little more bad than just unfavorable. And of course, it's skewed. Uh, it's a 30% uh, Democrat, 55% on the, on, the, on the GOP side. And again, I'm mentioning Republicans again because we've really seen it play out, especially in the last uh, <coughs> presidential primary debates and things like that. Um, and another problem is only 35% of Americans have ever even met a Muslim once. So I'm talking like having a Muslim cashier or a cab driver or a professor or anything. Only 35% of Americans have even encountered a Muslim. So the majority of America is trying to figure out who these people are from the internet and their friends and things like that. So it causes a lot of <coughs> misinformation. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. So Islamophobia is more than just uh, we found it's more than just traditional racism or prejudice. Old-fashioned prejudice is I don't like these people. They don't speak English. They believe weird things, and you know, they they're taking their jobs or whatever. I just don't like. Them. Or but but what Islamophobia has turned into, and what we've seen is no no. Not only do we not like these people, but the things they believe, their actual minds are so messed up that you know we they have their own idea of what Islam is. So you guys have all learned about the five uh, pillars, right? You know what those are. Those are the basic things that a Muslim has to do to be a Muslim. And so these trainings, what they'll say is, no, no, the, the five pillar stuff is just fake. The real Islam has, a, has another set of five pillars involving violence, terrorism, and things like that. And, and I'll go through those with you guys. Um, and again, I, I talked about the uh, Patriot stuff. Um, Okay, so what are the real five uh, uh, pillars? This is information like, this slide is, 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 is uh, something I got from one of these, one of these trainings. You know, so, um, imagine someone giving a presentation just like this about Islam <coughs> saying, you know, all that stuff about Hajj and, and praying five times a day, that, that's, yeah, yeah, you know, that's one thing. But the real Islam is this, and these are the real five pillars. Number one, stealth, jihad, or sharia takeover. Okay. All these things sound really uh, uh, corny, but there's, there's books written about this. There's a lot of work being put into this. Stealth Jihad is, uh, what, somebody take a guess. What, what do you think Stealth Jihad means? Yeah. Like going into the US and acting as somebody that you're not and then like having a terrorist attack or something. Okay. It's, a, it, it's actually much less. They, they actually, that's a good guess, but they, they say that even if you're not a terrorist, even if you're a peaceful, Muslim, you're engaging in some type of slow, quiet jihad that's going to change America. And then you ask them, well, give me examples of this. What are you talking about? They say, well, you know, uh, last year uh, Campbell's Soup came out with halal soups. the halal meat in their soup. And, and now they're in uh, grocery stores all over America. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This is your example of the Sharia takeover? Well, this is just the start. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, uh, we have soup now, uh, tomorrow, every Girls don't have to wear a scarf. So, so they start from soup and they say, this is going to, I mean, that, that's impossible anyway. But they start from something really, really ridiculous. And then, and then uh, fear monger about what can happen later. Um, they give examples of, of the two or three uh, congressmen who are Muslim. They say, OK, this is just a start. Uh, 20 years from now, uh, all of Congress is going to be Muslim. How is that possible? Where 1 to 2% of the population is not possible. But, so it's just a lot of uh, fear mongering. Uh, the next one is taqiyya. I actually did not know, it, it is an Arabic word, it sounds like one, that's what it is. 
Um, I actually did not know what this was until I started doing the research and started hearing about it. Um, we actually had an event last year uh, where we went out to a church and we did a presentation on Islam and we um, interacted and some folks from the Tea Party came and protested. And, and I said, okay, you know, this is actually not bad. Maybe we can talk to the people we really need to talk to. And if they're really scared, then let's just see what, what they're thinking. And so I spent an hour talking to one of them saying, look, I was born and raised here. I can name the entire uh, you know, offensive line of the Eagles. I mean, what, what more do you want me to say? <laughs> so, so I, I, was, I was just doing all that, and then she said, well, you know, you've been trained to lie since birth. I was like, I just spent an hour, and now you said all the things I'm saying is a lie. So the concept of Atakiya is a Muslim has been trained to lie since birth, and they, all they do is lie. So I'm here standing in front of you guys. Um, this whole thing is a lie. I'm going to go back to my office. The, the bookshelf is going to turn. I'm going to go downstairs to the back cave and plan terrorism. So that's kind of that's kind of the idea. That every single Muslim is a liar. And the sad thing is that the last time we saw this term used historically was actually during World War II, the Holocaust, and it was placed on Jews because a lot of Jews said, "No, we're we're patriotic. We're not against Germany or anything." And the Nazis said, "No, you are engaging in Turkey." And I I, I tried to draw the Link and I realized that um, during the Spanish, uh, when, when the Spanish were um, pushing the Jews and the Muslims out of Spain and just killing or uh, throwing everyone out, both rabbis and imams told Jews and Muslims that, hey, you, if your life is on, the, is on the line and someone's asking you what your religion is and you say Jew or Muslim, you're gonna get killed. Just say, just say you're a Christian or a Catholic and save your life. So you're allowed to lie at that. And that's where the concept came from. Both the Jews and Muslims used it. That it's common sense, of course. I mean, I'll say anything just to have I'll whatever, right? So um, that's where it came from. They turned it, and they turned it into well, a Muslim is supposed to lie all the time. And what that does is just shuts down conversations. It shuts down dialogue. So like, I can't even talk to you. Like, hey, can I? You have all these bad feelings about Islam. Why don't you come over to my house and see how we really live? Why don't you come to a mosque? No, no, no. You're just gonna lie anyway. So it's just a cheap trick to uh, just shut down conversation. Uh, the third thing is condemning terrorism. You know, organizations like mine, like CARE, will say, you know, we, we totally stand against terrorism. We would stand in the way of anybody who wants to hurt our countries, my country too. And um, that's a lie too. Muslims actually quietly, with a wink and a wink, actually promote terrorism and actually like it and cheer it on. So that's another big belief. Um, Fourth is, Islam is not even a religion, it's a political system. A political system like communism or fascism. So, so it's, not, it's, not, it's not a religion like Christianity or Judaism, it's a political system. And I, I was like, How? that's just dumb, where do you get that from? And we realized that 35 mosques in America are actually being blocked from expansion or from being built. And, and in a lot of them, the lawsuit, the actual lawyer who they hired, his or her argument is, the First Amendment, which provides what? Freedom of religion, should not apply to Muslims or the construction of this mosque because it's not a religion anyway. So people believe in this so much that they've hired lawyers to, to, to file these expensive lawsuits to block mosques uh, based off of that. Really. And the most, and the biggest one and the saddest one is piety equals extremism. The more you pray, the more you give charity, the more outward you look like a Muslim, you know, you are going to be extreme. And, and, and so this, uh, the, the uh, consequences of this are profound. profound. Now, you guys might think, well, this goes against everything we just learned. This is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. It's not even logical. Like, even if you don't know anything about Islam or Muslims, like, like, like if you sat your mom or your, your dad down and I was saying this, they would, even they would say, well, this, this just doesn't sound right. It's kind of weird. How can an entire group of people be like that, right? It defies common sense. But what happens when our own government starts to believe that? What happens when law enforcement or police officers believe that? What happens when um, your, your school teacher believes that and you're the only Muslim in the class? There's some really big uh, consequences and that's what I'm going to go into next. All right, so before I do that though, the biggest uh, sort of product of these anti-Muslim organizations, um, the biggest product has been the Sharia conspiracy theory. Uh, can somebody define Sharia real quick? Pop quiz? Extra credit? 
Just a quick uh, definition. Of, yeah. Um, as long as there is a green tradition. Yeah, but, but, but more simply, just sort of uh, recommendations and guidelines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guidelines on how to live. So well, one of the guidelines I follow is uh, uh, stairs. No, I'm still. Um, I, I, I don't need pork. Okay. That, that, that's how I practice Sharia. Or I, um, I pray five times a day. That's, that's, a, that's a guideline to follow. 25 states in this country now today have proposed a law in their state houses that would ban Sharia. They don't even know what Sharia is. They think it's, uh, I don't know, stoning, killing, all sorts of nuts, honor killings, all the things that sound scary about Islam and Muslims. But they're actually proposing this law. And the most recent one being uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and that's going to be stopped. We're very close to uh, killing that. But um, one of the, I suppose I shouldn't say killing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the way this law started was from one dedicated anti-Muslim organization. They said, you know what, we want, we want to ban Islam in America. How do we ban this religion? How do we make it illegal to be Muslim? Like, people are actually thinking that. And then somebody said, well, you can't really do that uh, because Islam is a religion and it is protected under the First Amendment. We have a constitution. We're, we're a civilized nation. You can't do that. Uh, but what you can do is try to pass a law against Sharia, make it really hard to be a Muslim in this uh, country because Americans are afraid of the term Sharia. It's exotic. It doesn't really make sense. And um, most, most people think it's stoning and things like that. Let's just pass laws against Sharia. But what this law would do would really make Muslim life difficult. It would really harass Muslims in America. I'll tell you how. Um, say, say I went to a restaurant. Okay, I'm going I'm to do a, a quick uh, legal sort of uh, uh, legal point. I'm going to make a legal point. Um, judges in American courts consider outside things all the time. Okay, so. Um, I'll give you an example. If I, if I went to a halal restaurant that, that was selling me halal cheeseburgers and I was eating them all year and they were great, and I found out the guy was selling me pork and it was a prank, and I wanted to sue him for, for uh, selling me the wrong thing. Um, you can do that. You can sue somebody for that, right? And a judge would have to say, well, okay, you're suing this person for uh, not providing you halal meat, even though he said he would. Uh, what's this halal thing? I have to look into the definition of halal, which comes from Sharia. So the judge would have to consider Sharia. The judge would have to, and they do this all the time. They do this for for Jews and and, and uh, halakha law, which is which is a Jewish law. They do this for corporations. I mean, Toyota has factories in America, but there's Japanese law that 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 uh, comes into play there, right? So judges do this all the time. What this law would do is say judges can't even consider that. So that, if I wanted to bring that lawsuit, the judge would say, nope, I can't define halal because that's Islamic and that's against the law. You can't do anything there. Um, if, if me and Aisha were married overseas, if we got married from, uh, you know, if we were married in uh, Pakistan and our marriage uh, uh, contract or license even, or license, no, 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 marriage uh, a certificate said, um, this marriage has been done uh, from an imam and it's an Islamic marriage, it would be invalid here. Or um, if I had a will, and my will said, you know, when I die, I want my assets and my money split according to what the Quran says, which is, you know, a certain part to your kids, a certain part to your wife, and if your parents were still alive, a certain part to your parents. A judge would say, no, nope, I can't consider Islam in this court. When in fact they do that all the time, for especially for family things. Um, you know, if, if you have a will and you're religious, you can do that if you're Jewish. If you're Catholic, you can write in your will that I want. Um, my, my faith to be considered in the court. And so these laws would block that. Um, it's a really in your face, I mean, I, I am actually still shocked that this is, this is even happening now in 2012. Now, 25 states have proposed the ban, meaning they've written the law. Um, only four actually passed it, uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas, and all four are being sued by my organization. It's gonna be blocked. It's, very, it's a very simple lawsuit, First Amendment, freedom of religion, all of our arguments are in defense of the Constitution, not because it hurts our feelings or anything like that. Um, so uh, so uh, those will be stopped, but, but it's amazing. The, the, uh, the uh, consequence that this creates is, for, for example, say if you're an employer and you're, you own a small business and you have a Muslim employee and you say, hey, my government is passing a law against you. Uh, I should fire you. You're that dangerous that my own government has to pass a law against you. 
So there's really serious uh, consequences about that. All right, in politics, um, you know, imagine imagine saying this about any group. Imagine saying, uh, you know, and he actually goes on and says, you know, not, you, we could take out the holy sites, bomb, not gonna, yeah, this is a senator. Imagine him saying, uh, you know, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was hard to be uh, Catholic in this uh, uh, country. There was a lot of anti-Catholic uh, uh, sentiment. Imagine in the 40s and 50s if someone said, well, you could just nuke the Vatican if you have a problem with Catholics. You can't say that about any other group in America. But you can say that about Islam and Muslims. And it's perfectly fine. His poll ratings went up after this. So um, that's a blatant example of Islamophobia and politics. Um, just recently, yes, sir. I'm going to backtrack, but is it illegal to be Islam to be Muslim in Tennessee now? Oh, yeah. I just, uh, I don't want, yeah. So Tennessee had um, actually, in their law, they had actually proposed a 15 year prison sentence, like just for practicing Sharia. So you guys all know before you. Before we pray, you have to wash yourself a little bit, wash your face, your hands, and stuff before you pray. So if you get caught doing that in a public bathroom, you can be arrested 15 years in jail for practicing Sharia. Uh, of course, that that was that was blocked. It was, it's being sued, and so they passed a much more watered down version of it. But the fact that this was proposed for washing yourself, for washing your face, uh, is insane. It, it goes to show how far how far it's gone. Yeah. Um, at the at, Two, two months ago, there was a CNN uh, presidential debate. Mr. Newt here said we should have a federal law so Sharia can't be considered by any court. We got we got applause. He, he also went on to say that the biggest threat facing the United States is Sharia and Muslims taking over. Really, the biggest threat the biggest threat facing the United States is Muslims taking over. So you know that has uh, consequences. These are people that uh, that are leaders. People look up to them. They expect them to say things that are responsible, and then and, you know you end up getting hate crimes and all sorts of other things because people say, well, this guy said it, he must be right. He's a powerful person, he's knowledgeable. I'm going to trust him. Okay, so the video on the left I'm going to show you guys, um, this was taken uh, uh, last year from the Voters, the Values Voters Summit. It's a huge convention that happens in D.C. every four years during election time. Um, it's a conservative uh, summit. So every Republican presidential candidate who wants to win has to be there. Romney was there. Even Ron Paul was there. I like Ron Paul. He was there. Um, uh, who else? Of course, Newt was there. Everyone. Herman Cain. This is back when like 20 people were trying to run for uh, president. So everyone was there. And this is one of the opening speeches during that, during that convention. So take a look. It is no exaggeration to say that Christian statesmen created the United States of America. Now, our Muslim friends also believe in a creator God. But it's important that our next president understand that Christians and Muslims do not worship the same God. <laughs> I believe it's important that we have a president who understands that Islam is not a religion of peace, but a religion of war and violence and death. Every single mosque in America is a potential recruiting or training cell for Islamic terror. We need a president who understands that the greatest long-range threat to our security and liberty is not radical Islam, but Islam itself. This is not, this is not Islamophobia, this is Islamorealism. I believe our next president needs to understand that the more devout a Muslim becomes, the more likely he is to act on one of those 109 verses. That means the more devout a Muslim becomes, the more of a threat he becomes to our national security. 
Now, of course, there are many moderate Muslims. Most Muslims in America have no intention of acting out on any one of those 109 commands. But we must understand that while there may be moderate Muslims, there is no such thing as moderate Islam. You guys believe me now. Okay. All right. Um, what happens? What happens if you? Okay. So some of the uh, uh, the consequences of that. If you if you have surrounded yourself with that type of uh, thinking and language. Again, we get calls maybe once a week. Uh, hey, my, my boss just found out I was a Muslim, and now he's fired me after working for ten years. Uh, here in, in, in the Philadelphia area, we we get calls from parents saying. You know, the school is such a hostile place for my kid that I'm actually going to start homeschooling him. So these are the direct uh, consequences of this. Uh, mosque opposition, I told you guys, 35 mosques were being sued or blocked. Um, hate crimes, uh, so they're, they're rare, but, but maybe every six months to a year, somebody would just come in and beat up to a vault saying, somebody said, hey, Muslim, they chased me down and got uh, uh, beat up. Uh, psychological and marginalization, a lot of Muslims are actually accepting this. They're saying this is how it's going to be. Let's just deal with it. Uh, we find out. I, I won't vote. I won't do anything else besides leaving the house and going to work. Um, and then law enforcement. So the, the, the things you guys just heard uh, that guy say, um, you know, what happens if somebody from the NYPD or the FBI believes that? This is an actual PowerPoint chart from FBI agent training that said, um, it's really weird, but all, all, three, all three religions started off violent, right? and then they, the people who are the Torah and Bible, I don't know why he has Torah and Bible, it should be Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So Jews and Christians moved to a more peaceful state, and the Muslims have stayed violent. And the FBI has actually changed this after, uh, after a couple of really bad media reports. They exposed all this stuff. A couple of uh, newspapers exposed all this. and so. Uh, uh, President Obama himself and the Department of uh, Justice said you guys have to change all this stuff. But a lot of agents were trained in this. What happens when, you know, training is just a start. So, okay, I've been trained in this. I think uh, my boss has told me all Muslims are violent. Okay, what policies, what am I going to tell my agents to do? Well, here's a consequence. Almost every single mosque in America is spied on. Uh, um, people have come to our office and say, well, the FBI approached me and said, can I walk into my mosque with an iPhone and record things that people are saying. So people are telling us that they're being approached to do this stuff. And our problem with it is not the fact that it's just strange and weird and, and completely ineffective, but the fact that there are terrorists, absolutely, there are Muslims who want to be terrorists and they're being missed by this type of, by these type of shenanigans, you know. You know, so there are guys who want to do bad things, but they're, they're, they're under the table, they're driving right by, they're, they're not going to mosques, they're, they're in their uh, basements uh, going online trying to figure out how to make bombs. So they, they exist, but if you, if you engage in this kind of stuff, you miss them, and then what? Nobody is safer. So that's a problem. You know, what happens if the NYPD believes some of the things that we just heard? I'll show you what happened. They actually a few years ago, film student Jawad Rasool went on a whitewater rafting trip with the Muslim student group from his school, the City College of New York. He's now looking at a secret police file with his name on it. He recently learned an undercover police officer went on the trip. He has a hunch who it was. We knew this one person who was, uh, his life story just didn't make sense now that we think about it. Uh, you know, someone uh, relatively older than the rest of the college kids, uh, but someone who always has time to come to every single trip, even though he says he works. The only reason he knows he was being spied on during the trip is because of these secret police files leaked to the Associated Press. The undercover officer wrote about the trip in great detail. The report makes note that the students, quote, prayed at least four times a day, and much of the conversation was spent discussing Islam and was religious in nature. All of this is normally protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution and is not supposed to be included in secret police files. Which is really uh, heartbreaking. We're trying to be good American citizens. We're trying to, you know, pay our taxes, work here, uh, buy things that are American-made, 
so we could help the economy, but then there is another group that's, that thinks that we are uh, foreigners and trying to destroy this country. These new documents show the potential overreaching by the NYPD in the decade following the 9-11 attacks, as detailed in a series of reports by the AP. The NYPD is the nation's largest police force and routinely sends officers out of state and out of the country to gather intelligence. These newly acquired documents show how the NYPD has surveilled Muslim student groups at Ivy League colleges like Yale and the University of Pennsylvania and other schools like the State University of New York at Buffalo. NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly says the department only follows legitimate leads about suspected criminal activity. We believe we're doing what we have to do pursuant to the law to uh, protect this city, the city that's been attacked successfully twice and had 14 plots uh, against it in, uh, you know, in the last uh, two decades. Donna Lieberman of the New York Civil Liberties Union says everyone should be worried about the lack of checks and balances on the NYPD. When the police department is free to put innocent people under surveillance by the hundreds of thousands, um, then, then, number one, we don't know whether we're under surveillance for no reason at all. And number two, who's to say that we're not next? In a statement, the City College of New York said, quote, absent specific evidence linking a member of the City College community to criminal activity, we do not condone this type of investigation. The college says it was unaware the NYPD was watching students. Ted Chaffrey, Associated Press, New York. So I'm short on time. Uh, what I'm going to do is skip over to my last slide. So you guys have a sense of, you know, all this goofy stuff was being said. It's kind of weird. But now it's really turned into something real. It's turned into actual government policies. Uh, and my final point, who's safer when you spy on a Muslim threat? It's really the... Muslim so uh, Student Association is, is, a, is more of a co-ed threat. This is people hanging out. And so we have our tax dollars being spent on spying kids just like you guys, just like you guys. And you heard the University of uh, uh, Pennsylvania was one of them. Um, so here's something that you guys all can do. You've all taken this class. You have knowledge now. You have knowledge. You have the facts. You know what this faith is about. And quite frankly, you probably will run into someone who believes in that stuff. You might run into a coworker, a friend, anybody. You might see something on Facebook. Um, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to join an organization or anything. Just speak up. When you see somebody say, um, "Oh, you know, I heard they took over with Sharia," you say, "Excuse me, where did you hear that from? Can you can you explain that?" Oh no, no, I, I just heard it. I read it somewhere. No, you can't just say I read it somewhere. You have to back up your statements. And so challenge people with the knowledge that you have, and even ask. Like, you don't have to have a lot of Islamic knowledge. It's just common sense. How is one to two percent of the population going to? Going to take over the United States. When I elect 400 congressmen, 60 plus uh, senators, and a president, and even then, if they pass a law that said Islam is going to be replace the Constitution, the Supreme Court would say this is illegal. So there's just checks and balances in this uh, country. So most people who believe in this stuff don't even know how America works and how American laws work. So challenge people. Take your um, education out there and say, uh, you know. You're not allowed to just make things up anymore. You can't just go on the internet and say these things. Um, and if you, if you hear an elected official say something, write a letter. Um, it goes a long way. So thank you guys, and I'll open it up to questions real quick.